Okay, so I'm going to give our keynote speaker a very quick introduction so we have as much time as possible for the session. Um, Nancy Sherman is our keynote speaker, distinguished university professor and professor of philosophy at Georgetown University. Uh, she is a New York Times notable author, uh, most recently of Stoic Wisdom, Ancient Lessons for Modern Resilience. I got to know her in part through her work uh, from, from quite some time ago, Stoic Warriors, which I recommended to quite a few of my own uh, ROTC students at, at Marist College. She has won many different awards and honors for her work. Um, I, I'm not even going to try to rehearse them here, including a Guggenheim Fellowship, and she is the inaugural Distinguished Chair in Ethics at the U.S. Naval Academy. She has made many, many contributions for decades, not only to understanding Stoicism, not only to understanding Hellenistic philosophy, but to understanding ancient philosophy in general and in its application. So with that, I'm turning it over to Nancy, and uh, can we get her unmuted very quickly? Jump right back in. Go ahead, Nancy. If you if you can, can you I, unmute. Excellent. Just, woo. Okay. I wasn't able a moment ago. Th Andy, thank you. Um, so, thank you. Okay, my pleasure. Um, we were all calm and collected, so that's good. <laughs> so um, I'm I'm the uh, cleanup act, as they say, and I stand. <laughs> I stand between you and dinner or sleep, whatever part of the planet you're on. Um, but first, it's been a long day, um, and I didn't know what all the speakers were say going to say. So there's a lot of overlap with what I'm um, saying and um, what you're hearing um, from others. But um, gratitude. This was a Herculean effort. And Hercules will show up at the end of my talk as well. And uh, I have to thank Greg, Masterful, Andy, Shaka, so many thanks. They put hours and hours and hours. Phil, who may not be here right now, and the founders, Chris, uh, Massimo, Donald, um, John Sellers, and many others. What a, what a delight. So thank you all. And on the theme of gratitude, just lest it, uh, it slips by us, Seneca, in one of my favorite um, uh, texts on favors, uh, on benefactions, uh, says no impassive face when you're showing gratitude. Rather, you should show it without a downcast, uh, without downcast eyes or a furrowed brow, um, because if you do, it's like giving a gift with a bread with stones in it. Or he says, gratitude, uh, uh, words of gratitude will fail us if we feel in, if we fail to show the indebtedness that we should, and it should show on our faces. So you can't, maybe some of you can show it on your faces, but to Greg and the whole team, Andy, Phil, I am going to uh, give my applause to you on my face and in my body language. So thank you very much. So um, what I wanna talk to you about uh, today uh, is resilience through social grit. That seems to be a theme that has come up and I'm really delighted uh, to say that and to have seen that. But I have to just say that I, I came by stoicism after you know decades of work on Aristotle because I was at the Naval Academy, Academy and I in fact just gave a talk there um, in front of the statue of Stockdale who had the great fortune of interviewing many times um, where the theme of, of suck it up and truck on still lives, much to the chagrin of many of the officers who teach there, um, or less elegantly embrace the suck. And so this idea that we are impassive, we should be impassive to, to fortune and simply um, truck on without asking for help runs counter to everything I believe and stand for. And I'm sure many of you do as well from what I heard all day. I've worked for several decades uh, with the military on issues of moral injury, post-traumatic stress, and in general, trying to destigmatize mental health in the face of horrible uh, suicide epidemics that we've had here in, in the States. And so the, the idea that 
stoicism should be the mantra of suck it up uh, is something that I really felt impelled to correct in many ways. So this is a very impassioned subject for me. Um, and I, I think many of my views actually um, cohere with many of those I've been listening to today. What's often obscured in the um, modern conversation, some strands of it, not all, and, and certainly not necessarily here, um, is that while stoicism depends on inner resilience and strengthened will, it also depends on the sustenance and support of others. And you just have to go to Marcus. Um, it, it's everywhere. Uh, we're woven together by a common bond with scarcely one thing foreign to another. Um, and here he's telegraphing Zeno, the founder's um, image of a cosmic city, which itself is a, a, a trope from, uh, well, he borrows from Plato's Republic to some degree. And um, resilience, he's saying, depends not just on our own will or strength of will. So here I will play the devil's advocate to some of the conversation today. It depends, says, uh, says, excuse me, Marcus, a coordinated, well-informed and cooperative efforts of others whose goodwill we depend on. And I will add structural, um, enlightened structures and institutions as well, not just the one-on-one -on -one personal interaction, but the structures and institutions we all live with and in. But there just is a puzzle and it's hard to dissolve the puzzle or make it disappear. And that is, aren't the methods of stoic strengthening of individual will and arming against vulnerability at bottom in tension with dependence or reaching out to others, or as um, Bob Putnam once put it in his famous book, Bowling Alone, social capital. So how do you, um, how do you put these two ideas together? Now, Marcus's image of our social connectedness is really visceral. He's on the battlefield of the Danube campaigns, the end of the um, second century common era. And he says, picture a hand uh, or, uh, or, or leg separated from the trunk. That's what we make of ourselves when we cut ourselves off from each other. And we can't be at home in the world. We can't find oikiosis, uh, act fittingly or becomingly if our good is reduced to self-interest or resilience to self-reliance, a kind of Emersonian self-reliance. And he says, Marcus says, the idea will come home to yourself if you say to yourself, I'm a member of a system made up of reasonable or rational beings. Now, Kant, got, uh, Manuel Kant, uh, 18th century, uh, took that into uh, a theme of how it is we are connected in a commonwealth of ends. Um, it's not that well developed by the Stoics, but it becomes a, a, the late motif, I would say, of, of um, rational enlightenment theory. So Marcus is thinking about his connectedness as we heard earlier. I think Chris mentioned it in the beginning of our, of our, of our conference today. And that is that he's thinking he's paying homage uh, in a very humbling way as a, hum, uh, as a kind of humble supplicant to his parents, his grandmother, his grandfather, to a painting tutor. And my favorite is to a grammarian who taught him not to carpet people for logic howlers or for too exotic an expression. So um, he's trying to sort of tone down his, uh, his causticness um, when he's listening to others and, and model uh, a generous and gracious spirit. And that social capital is also in Seneca. In his letters, he says, um, now, these are probably, it's a, it's a literary form, an epistolary literary form, but every time a letter comes from you, Lucilius, I'm with you. And so he's, he's really imagining his life with others and how he will go through it with others. Still, it's hard to connect all that with a theme that has run through this conference, but, but and somewhat in tension with it. Strengthen your will. It's inside you. You can be strong. And if you only, you know, the dichotomy of control take on uh, what you can and you will be liberated. Now, I think the Stoics try to ease the tension a bit by famously with horrible language, arguing that external goods, what Aristotle called external goods are indifference with a TS. They're not, you're not in, it's not a matter of uh, apathy or indifference. 
you prefer or disprefer them, as we've said, promote or demote them. They're not real goods. Virtue is the real good. Um, but um, they still will play a very, very substantive role in your life because they're part of your uh, preference and dispreference behavior. So here's the critical move, I think, not in calling things indifference or preferred or dispreferred, but they really think that virtue itself is about wise selection. They don't even use the word choice. You're, you can't use that word choice. It's about wise selection or rejection of external uh, goods. And it comes with a behavioral attitude. So this very much is why cognitive behavioral theorists or REBT, rational emotive behavioral therapy we were just hearing about, is relevant. And that is you're supposed to learn new ways of engaging with the material of the external world. And so it's a, it's a, a recalibration of your values. But in addition, you're supposed to get rid of Sticky attachment, I, I like to say, acquisitive attachments, things you have to hold on to with all your might, and also um, panicky aversion, that kind of way that we, um, we, we don't press the pause button, but immediately um, try to avert um, fears or threats. So some would argue, and here's the devil's advocate coming in, the philosopher's object, objections. Um, well, we're just not cut out very well to get our emotions in line with our value recalibrations. And some, some would argue and have actually quite eloquently of late that we need bioenhancers because we can't sync ourselves with, with a, 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 a view of nature or a view of the world uh, that we might understand intellectually. So all this bootstrapping of ourselves through behavioral techniques and affective training might not be enough. I am not one for bioenhancement, but I will say, I'll just put it out there. That is uh, one skeptical response to a stoic practice. All right. So at the you've heard a lot about this at the heart of of regaining control of your approach and avoidance, I'll call them behaviors, is uh, ascent. And that comes with the dichotomy of control. Uh, some things in the world are up to you, others are not up to us or our faculties of judgment, belief, desire, our mental states, essentially. Now, many of us would protest right off the bat, even if we can't fully avoid stuff outside, um, we can, you know, loss of work, a safe homeland, we can do some things to protect our health, to try to find safe harbor, um, to build the communities we live in. And maybe Epictetus grants that, but he says at some point, you will be a hostage to fortune. You will just have to be able to see that certain things are beyond your control. But it, and, and there are things outside yourself, but your own volition or, or voluntary control is quite strong. But again, we might object to that. We just heard uh, individuals working uh, in this on this front for what's inside isn't in our control fully. I might you know, wake up with a stroke, as we just heard about, um, or uh, aging brains. Um, I deal with individuals that have tra traumatic brain injury from war. Um, cravings not in line with our um, with what we want to want, um, pathological fears, and so on. So, or we might, as philosophers say, have epistemic biases. We might see through lenses that aren't easily our own doing, and it's very hard for us to step back and get rid of the taint. You might say some of it may be products of upbringing and just access um, uh, um, limitations. And you, now that's a modern view of how we see the world of philosophers called standpoint epistemology. Um, and even so, the Stoics would say we ha we're much more volitional, voluntaristic than, than a modernist might say. But I think actually the Stoics give us interesting ways of of trying to uh, change our standpoints. And the idea is this, it's with uh, assent. They actually say that you can say yay or nay to things that come in from outside. And in the case of 
uh, sensory input that is related to things you want, so umfi ones, uh, affective impressions um, from their word hormai, our word hormone, very stimulating. Um, I, I think of them as umfi imp impressions. You can try to put a buffer between what comes in and how you interpret it. And this is Seneca from On Anger in book two. Anger is undoubtedly set in motion by an impression received of a wrong, but does it follow immediately on the impression and break out with any involvement of the mind? Our view is it undertakes nothing on its own, but only with the mind's approval. We heard early er, that the first step may be a first motion or a, proto, a propathei, um, Joseph Ledoux, the neurobiologist, thinks of them as low road emotions, arousals, starts and startles that come upon you. You don't necessarily ascent or suspend, suspend ascent, but then when you have a moment, you might put a block um, on them if they are um, disruptive. So, but I'd still say we should be wary here. Um, so again, a bit of a devil's advocate. Um, Sometimes we can't easily control what we say yay or nay to, and that is in part because our minds are to some degree social constructs. So here I'm thinking of, of right now, um, the debate about Instagram with young children, teens, and how bullying the environment can be, um, and, and that their impressions of who they are are very much formed by what others think of them. And it's very hard for them to break away from a socially constructed sense of themselves and maybe a healthier self image. Or I'm thinking of too many, I fear students of mine, victims of rape who um, really have internalized someone else's view of the shame that they did something to bring it on. Or this sort of was on my mind as I was thinking about France and. Um, pedophilia in the in the um, uh, Catholic world, uh, a boy's mind um, may about what happened um, with a priest when he was when the boy was very young, may get garbled in his mind or muted the horror of it by the priest's sacred robes, his avuncular role at the Sunday table. Um, and the, the inner world can be a socialized construct. And it's not always an enlightened place for freedom. I think that is a mistake. Anyone that studies in the mind knows the mind isn't always um, a safe place. And so Epictetus makes it very safe. Stockdale, um, you know, always said to me, um, the silver lining of my being a POW is that I came to Epictetus, his wife, Sybil Stockdale, marched into the dining room and said, I, I get my liberation in different ways. So um, think of um, a, a wonderful memoir of late um, by Gabriel Byrne, Walking with Ghosts for the Complexity of of the inner world and how it's sometimes a social construct. So the Stoic claim is that if we monitor what we assent to, we can push fairly far out the limit, um, press the pause button enough so that runaway impulsive impressions from within or without don't blind us. But I think we need very socially supportive cooperative communities to do that work. We can't just do that work alone. And we often need to all, not just informal communities, but actually change the structures outside that deeply influence how we see ourselves and even the very control we have of our world. So one of the better known um, uh, techniques is of course, and mentioned, um, rehearse the future, rehearse future ills. Don't be blindsided. Um, the pandemic may not come very often, but we might, maybe we could have done more to anticipate it. Um, and it's an old notion that comes uh, quoted by um, uh, Cicero uh, quotes a fragment from Euripides. So it was it was in the in the literature for a very long time, and I don't. Those of us that teach, I don't. I don't think I have ever mentioned Anaxagoras's claim, I always knew my child was mortal, without my students thinking I was the most unfeeling and callous person in the world. 
And that, um, you know, and if their parents said that to them in the morning, uh, when they kiss them goodbye, you know, their parents would be would have this morbid fear that they, that, that they, um, they the child wouldn't be coming home at the end of the day. But I think the idea is in just magical thinking. The Stoics say the loss and fear can be very raw. They use this wonderful word, prosphatas, which means like, like raw meat. It's very fresh and we have to try to dull it a little bit by anticipating it. And so I have this, um, and Seneca in letter 63 says he, he chastises himself for not doing it enough when his friend, his young friend, um, Anaya Serenus, um, died unexpectedly. He was much younger than Seneca. And so Seneca said, he grieved, he cried terribly. And he said, you know, if I had pre-rehearsed it and said that age didn't matter, um, I might be in a better place right now because I didn't do this. Fortune struck me suddenly and unprepared. So I was thinking about this a little bit. And my mother at 97 couldn't talk about death. And this, I was, you know, a primary caregiver and I would visit her several times a week in the nursing home. And I had to figure out a way that I could broach the subject with her because she wasn't going to mention it if I didn't. So I had a little dance and it was our dance. And it was a, uh, it was this, I said, you know, mom, just remind me, did I sign you up for the immortality plan? Because if I did, it's going to be really expensive. Well, this was my ticket. My mom and I were on the same page. And so Occasionally, even at the dinner table with her other three friends, she had a, a, a foursome who, who ate dinner together regularly. I would say, Mom, remind me, was there an immortality plan? Did we sign up? So we did this little dance, and I think it was her way of acclimating to a very dreaded subject. Um, and I, it, I, I think of it as a stoic tact in a certain way. Now, there's a, I want to just mention um, the stoics tell you to prepare in advance of the, with, for the ills because those are the ones that will um, really get you. But in, in chatting with a friend who's a neurobiologist, she was saying, you know, there, is, there are studies out there of, we know about uh, prolonged exposure therapy which is um, therapy uh, often in, in PTSD treatment to try to detoxify hypervigilance. But there's also pre-exposure, but not just of risk, it's pre-exposure of, uh, of neutral stimuli. So the Israeli Defense Force in conjunction with Walter Reed in my neighborhood and the NIH, National Institutes of Health here in DC, uh, there's a, a notion of trying to get the brain through computerization to not just focus on threat stimuli in advance of, of, of say, combat, but also neutral stimuli so that you have alternative grooves. And I think this is a wonderful idea. I often think, why don't we get pre-traumatized by what the Stoics are telling us? I mean, in the way that my students get very anxious when I say, you, you know, maybe your parents should say, I always knew my child was mortal or kiss your child goodbye as if it's the last time. Th that we need to have pre-exposure, I think, um, to, to good as well as bad things. So in the case, so this is called attention bias um, modification training so that we can make the risk uh, grooves a little bit more transient and have alternatives. Um, so, um, Epictetus, of course, talks about moving from triflings to serious matters, breaking a jug, going to the public baths that may be very noisy with pickpockets and jostlers nearby until eventually we talk about co contemplating death. And um, I want to. Um, move on to another one of the techniques, again, that I think is enhanced by thinking of it in terms of the social tissue of our connections. And this is, I'll call it hedges and reservations, but mental reservations. So the idea is that you tag a, a, a conditional clause, an if clause onto your intention. I'll go for a, a, a boat ride, says uh, Seneca, unless it rains. 
I'll become a predator. I'll become a, a, an elect. I'll, I'll have, be an elected official unless I lose the election. So I was again teaching this, and I was thinking, wait a minute. I just was. I, I actually hadn't just read this, but I remembered that Virginia Woolf's *To the Lighthouse* begins with this line: "Yes, of course. If it's fine tomorrow," says Mrs. Ramsey to her six-year-old son. I think he is James. We'll go to the lighthouse if it's fine. Now, the whole theme of the book is not just to put a hedge on your expectation. It's about how she connects with her little boy. We've heard a lot about education and, and, and talking to children in the last session. And I was thinking, and I actually read this in class the other day, the little boy is so excited about going to the lighthouse. They're on the Isle of Skye in the Hebrides. And he, he, he desperately wants to go to the lighthouse. And the mother is sort of trying to say, well, she's knitting socks and maybe we will go if it doesn't. I mean, if you lived in Scotland, I lived there for four or five years. It's always raining. If it doesn't rain, <laughs> Mr. Ramsey, this very curmudgeon, he almost kind of, uh, maybe he has PTSD. It's the book was written 1927 to the lighthouse. He's a lecturer in philosophy in Cardiff. And he says, Boom, it will rain. And that just puts a cloud over this boy's hopes and expectations. So how do I think about reservation, mental reservation? Well, I think about this tacit mental reservation, as it's called, as not giving you a, like a, a cushion, like an airbag in your car that will always inflate, no matter you know if you if you come a, if you hit a bad bump in the road or something, but rather a little bit like um, financial planning. You always see in the brochures, um, past performance isn't a predictor of future performance. So it's that we have to be agile. We have to be adaptive. We can't get stuck on a plan. But as we learn nimbleness, we're learning nimbleness, I think, especially in the case of children. And if, if you're a parent, you always are thinking about how you say things. And if you're going to squash hopes and, and dreams, um, you're always trying to figure out how to do it in a connected way. And I think I recommend, it's not everyone's cup of tea, but go back and read it to the lighthouse. It's very much about how to keep a little boy's hopes up while still allowing the kid some agility and nimbleness. So the way uh, Epictetus puts it is go light on your impulses. Um, don't have, as I would put it, the ache of yearning and the strain and of panicky aversion or avoidance. It doesn't mean you're going to be anti-fragile, a word I hate, or bulletproof. I hate that one even more. But it does mean that you can be somewhat adaptive and nimble. Um, okay, so I want to um, leave some time for um, Q&A, but I want to just end on a, a, a note about, again, back to the social fabric, which I hope I've woven into my remarks um, by tempering some of these um, techniques for resilience through the ways in which we do them with others and structures and structures. So remember, Marcus says we're woven together by a common bond. He's got the cosmos in his mind. It's a theme, of course, in Aristotle, we are social animals. For Aristotle, it was the polis and not the, and not the, uh, the universe. Um, and the, I, so the Stoics never deny the social fabric, but their focus is on how to maintain it in the face of fragility, uh, how to keep, uh, how to be able to flourish in the face of one's vulnerability. And their notion, this, this language they have of preferred indifferences, preference, dis preference behavior is all um, meant to help us in that direction. Um, but I, I, I want to, um, bookend my remarks um, by returning to Hercules. I said that um, Andy and um, Greg and, um, and Phil and, and, and the founders all were Herculean in their effort. Well, now I want to just end by thinking about uh, Seneca's play, Hercules Rages. So briefly, Hercules has finished his uh, labors, his 12 labors. He's piercing through the barrier into this world for a homecoming to his family. 
And his stepmother, Juno, is you know, pissed off at him. This is the, the favored son of, 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 of Jupiter and not by her, uh, not her son. And so she's going to cast a spell on him, crazed. He'll kill his fa family in a blind stupor. And when he, so it's very much Greek tragedy here, but Roman style. And when he comes to, he sees the hordes of ghosts um, and the deed is by his own hand. And so he wants to commit suicide. And it's precisely at this moment when a loved one steps in and tries to calm him and bring him solace and support. And it's his soulful father, um, Amphitryon, who says, the grief is yours, the guilt your stepmother's. Um, bad luck is not your fault, whoever has, who has called an accident a crime. And then the, the comfort falls on kind of deaf ears and Hercules' companion is Theseus and he next intervenes as empathic peer counselor. And he says, burst through your troubles with your usual energy. Use your heroic courage to not, to, to not stay angry at yourself. Well, I, I find this a remarkable lesson uh, from a Stoic about a kind of heroic courage we don't often associate with Stoic strength. It is, um, you know, Stockdale found strength in the um, in the fellow POWs, including John McCain, who is a, a neighbor and a POW down the hall. Um, but Hercules is saying if he can muster the strength, it will be that of self-empathy modeled through the compassion or empathy that others are showing him. And it will be as every much a kind of her Herculean strength as his physical labor. Um, so I think that is a stoic lesson for our times. Um, and I would also say it's, it, it, it's sort of resonant with uh, Seneca's rallying call at the very end of uh, On Anger. He says, let us cultivate humanity. And I think that's what we've been doing all day. So thank you. And the floor is open. Greg, you're on. All right. So a lot of questions specifically about those two terms, anti-fragile and bulletproof. And before you, you say more about that, I will also say that I don't like those terms either. I, I especially bulletproof. There's something about it that really turns me off. Um, but people want to know why you don't like those terms in particular. So can ah, you, can you? Oh, I can. Eat. That's easy. I have spent 20 to 30 years working with the military. I have sat on suicide review boards. I have seen the highest folks up in the Pentagon and. and pull out their hair trying to save their troops because too many will not ask for help. Too many get trained thinking that they're going to be bulletproof until they aren't. Um, and by that, I mean, they lose a buddy. They, there's a collateral in, a horrible collateral incident where a kid is killed at a checkpoint. Um, the drone goes in the wrong place, et cetera. And the expectation to be bulletproof or to make yourself bulletproof is just not uh, what I think about ways of strengthening your, yourself through adversity. I'm all, you know, we can strengthen ourselves by learning lessons. You know, learning is from suffering, an old, an old Greek phrase, <laughs> but um, it's not an aim and goal. And I, I, I think we actually make for a damaged, a damaged cadre, a damaged force, and damaged children as well. So but, um, there you go. Yeah, and when, when veterans come home um, and they're part of the society and, and oftentimes have quite a lot of trouble reintegrating, right, because of those, those issues. I've seen that quite a lot in my family where uh, many of my family members have served. It just came up to me the uh, other day. We had someone in the house we had water and so and he, his visit was delayed and he said and he wanted to share with me why and he said his brother-in-law um just lost his brother-in-law um 
why? And he said, because um, he wouldn't take the vaccine. And then he also said, and he's a bodybuilder. And it turns out, you know, and he, he's in the military, he's special forces, 20 years in the military. He, he thought he was bulletproof. And I mean, it's naive, but also he ruined his kidneys by trying mm. to get so tough and strengthened that the, you know, once in ICU, they could not help him. He had organ failure. So anecdotal, but, you know, yeah. there's plenty of evidence there, out there. There's yeah. a couple other uh, follow-ups specifically about things that you brought up in the talk uh, from Elizabeth. Uh, could you expand more on what attention bias modification training is, how it enables the balancing of the risk grooves? Intrigued by this, would love to understand it further. Yeah, I'm not an expert on this. So I will um, just, and perhaps I can just type, it's an article by Wald and um, Danny Pine, P-I-N-E, and a guy named, um, um, I'm not sure I know his first name, but Bar Chaim. Um, it's, it's multiple authored. And essentially it's computerized. So they have um, stimuli of threat words, this is sort of often how computerizations work, threat words, and much more neutral words. And the idea is to try to be able to have um, modification of attention so that we're not just exposing uh, troops beforehand to threat, but also exposing them to, um, to more neutral stimuli. So there can be faster flipping. I mean, it's at the level of brain. This is not at the level of, of, um, of uh, conscious cognitive processing. Uh, it's subliminal, but they, and it's limited, but they have found that there's been some success in reduction of post-traumatic, of the hypervigilance that typically comes with PTSD. Yeah. So another one, uh, this is from Christopher. Can you expand on this connection between kindness and strength? Have you found that strength is required for kindness? A lot of times kindness is portrayed as, oh, you know, nice people. They're, you know, they, they do that naturally or they do that because they're not strong, right? Is, does kindness require strength? Oh, I think so. I, I well, kindness is really central to um, a, a wonderful Seneca essay. It's the heart of on benefactions or on favors, and maybe it's a, a lot about Roman decorum. So you know, we don't quite know what to make of make of the display behaviors that I was talking about before, as in showing my gratitude to you, my kindness toward toward you and Andy and Phil and others, but. Um, I think it takes a lot of strength to be kind um, because, you know, sometimes the reaction is piss off or, you know, or you got in my face or you dissed me or something of that sort. Or it actually also takes a, even more, I think, to be kind to yourself in the face of adversity or trauma. Um, and that is often learned through others. We sometimes need to take up others' perspective. And so we, in this case, Chris at Gill at the beginning of our sessions today talked about first person, but sometimes we need to take the second person perspective and impose it on ourselves so that we can be um, kinder to ourselves. You know, uh, with a follow-up on that, so, I'm teaching a class this semester specifically using this massive tome of Ursula oh, K. Le Guin. Mm -hmm. And the students really respond to it. I think because there's enough space in her stories for them to see themselves there in a lot of the emotional responses. Um, you know, we, we talk very often about learning through narratives and some narratives are useful for that and other narratives are, are much less useful. Um, you know, you brought up uh, that, that wonderful story and, and we, you know, so there's, there's um, first person and, and second person, but, but maybe sometimes we also get this through other people's stories as well. Uh, third person, um, how, sure, sure. Yeah. I think, you know, I would, I love to read novels when I can or listen to them. And I learn enormously and, you know, and it connects with what I'm thinking about as in this Virginia Woolf. It's not everyone's cup of tea, but <laughs> it, yeah. it, it's so much about the uh, um, parenting approaches to children's expectations where you don't rain on their parade, but on the other hand, try to <laughs> give them 
reasonable expectations and teach them to be a bit nimble. Okay. Here's another question coming in, um, sort of putting a couple different together about embracing the suck, this, this phrase, embrace the suck. And, Terrible phrase. <laughs> yeah. And actually I put in the thing when I was back, when I was in the military, cause I don't know, I'm you know, 51 years old, there was no embrace the suck. There was only suck it up, which was sort of an even worse phrase. Than that. Suck it up and truck on. Yeah. Exactly. So it looks like, I mean, it's an, an equivocal phrase. It can be used in different ways. People can see it as connected to the obstacle is the way. It can also, as uh, Fielding Isaacs points out, if, it, if it's peers saying it to each other, it can be a coping tool. But if it's being said in a power relation where somebody else is telling you, you have to embrace the suck, but they're not giving you, say, resources to, to do that, then it can become quite oppressive. So, I mean, can you talk a little bit more about mm, this, this yeah. phrase and what, what its potentials well, are? Well, that's good. Um, yeah, it's certainly that we're in a situation, we are, be, let's just boot camp, you're in deprivation. Okay. There's no way about it. You lose your name. You lose your hair. You lose, I mean, so it's, it, there's a reason you have long hair, right? You, know? <laughs> you lose your money too. Cause you buy all your own outfit. <laughs> so there's a lot of deprivation and, the, and, you know, and if you, and it goes on, but in addition, you're right. Um, you are trying to uh, give each other support you know, let's, let's, we're in it together. Let's move on. And so you can sort of think of a cadre or, you know, and, or you, I mean, we can get pretty fine grain. You can even think of mirror neurons. I'm not a fan of mirror neurons, but you can think when you're, when you're marching, you're almost proprioceiving another person's movements. It's so right. in sync, you know, uh, this kind of social grit um, in a cadre or in a, as dancers. And so there's a sense in which um, it's solidarity, uh, muscle bonding, if you like. That said, yes, if it's coming from some, you know, horribly sadistic um, drill sergeant who's breathing down your neck, um, you know, full metal jacket, think that it's horrible and it's very demeaning. It, and it's also it, the sense in which you can never ask for help. That's the downside. You can never ask for help because that's weakness. Um, and we don't, and we don't ask for help or we don't call it mental health. We, we have to give it some other term coaching. I mean, there's an example, right. you have to right. destigmatize it somehow. I'm, I'm going to shift this a little bit. Sure, if I, so Aristotle talks about in, in Nicomachean ethics, people who are at the extreme side of, of courage, way away seemingly from cowardice, he calls them, and we translate as the rash or things like that. And he says they're really cowards, actually, because they're often motivated by the fear of, of looking as if they're fearful. Mm -hmm. And so they have this extreme behavior. And I was wondering if there's something kind of like that in what you're describing. Uh, Counterphobic. Um, you might right. say people might say counterphobic. Um, you know, they they're daredevils uh, as a way of reacting against um, certain kinds of fears. Maybe there's some of that. Um, it's a sort of a complicated, you know, survival environment. So I and you know, and I would I would not survive well in that environment. I'm, I'm just nor I'm, would I at this time. <laughs> That said, um, I will just say, you know, having just taught midshipmen and officers, a, a woman came up to me after the talk and, and you know, and said, um, I'm so glad you're talking about stoicism this way, because I just have to tell you, whatever you hear maybe from the officers and from a different kind of um, book we're using these days, it's still about stoicism equals suck it up and truck on. That is the only, you know, and that's a very um, frightening way of making it in that world. That's all. Let me ask you one other question, because I don't see any others in the chat, but this is kind of an intriguing thing. And this is a very speculative one. So do you think that there are, there are prospects for us eventually within the military institutions and other institutions that are similar to them, like policing? Do you think 
maybe in a couple generations we get away from that misunderstanding of stoicism or is it is it like something perennial where we're almost like always having to lop off the the, the top and 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 um what are what do you think is going to happen yes i think well i see a lot of hope actually in having more um uh well, just to give you an example, in what's being read in compilations in a mil, you know, mm. I'm now speaking about the Naval Academy, but I, I, okay. I'm, it just because it's fresh in my mind. The compilations of Stoic texts aren't just Epictetus, is just, you know, handbook or as transmitted through Stockdale, which is how the Navy, at least in the Marines, get their, get their Stoicism. They know Stockdale inside out, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, but the, um, they're reading w- wider compilations and, you know, it may include Seneca, maybe some Marcus and, you know, some contemporary stuff. That's a very positive trend to my mind. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it, it's a, education in part. What are the texts? You know, we all as educators are always trying to expand our view of, uh, you know, in my department, ancient is not Greco-Roman. Ancient includes Indian, ancient includes Buddhist, Buddhism and Eastern. We, we must, you know, I'm old school if I think ancient philosophy is Greco, is equals Greco-Roman philosophy. So I think yeah. we, we widen the palette of what are available texts. And that goes a long way. Well, thank you very much for this this wonderful presentation and the, and this this keynote capping off the Stoicon conference. Um, let me also say thank you to all of our other speakers, the coordinators, the um, uh, panelists. Uh, who, who else do I have to bring in? All all of the people who did the breakout sessions, everybody else, uh, to Phil and Andy working behind the scenes, Harold organizing the, the lightning talks. Uh, this has been a, a really great day. We even got tested uh, through the, the tech issues. As well. So we had a little practical application of stoicism. We are going to have what we're calling an after party and it's nothing very formal. We're just, some of us are going to hang around and chit chat for a while. Uh, this concludes the official part of, of Stoicon. Um, anything else that you, you'd like to say, Nancy? Oh, not at all. I just think um, I, I'm looking at the chat. I wasn't able to keep up with it before. I think we all are deeply grateful if we somehow could, you know, I don't want to create cacophonous a breakdown of technology. <laughs> the, the Zeus like gods will really kill us. But thunderous, a thunderbolt <laughs> to, um, to you and Andy. I, I, you guys have been working around the clock. So um, I hope you.